Hey everybody, welcome back to Under the Loop with myself, Marco Nicolini with Grand Caliber. And today we've got some special watches to discuss. So let's dive right into it. Real brief, before we get into everything, today's wrist check, I am wearing a Rolex 6265. Here, I'll take it off, show you guys real quick. So you guys have might have seen this watch before. This is a 6265 that we talked about in the last Under the Loop. And it's been on my wrist since, I can't take it off. It is just one of my favorite watches ever. And it is for sale. I'll still sell it if anybody reaches out for it. But in the meantime, it is a stellar watch to wear and really enjoy. So there you have it, 6265 is on the wrist. And we have something similar to discuss. Uh, we'll dive into that here shortly, you'll see in the video. So let's get started. First watch we're gonna talk about today is the 25721 ST Audemars Piguet. It is called The Beast and it is called that for a very good reason. This is a lot of watch, it is a chunky watch and it was released in 1993. This Jared design has been around for quite some time and they definitely launched this watch with the intention of really making a statement and that they did with this Royal Oak Offshore. This isn't your typical Royal Oak. It is the Offshore series that has, you know, a lot more different features such as the dial layouts are a little bit uh, different such as you get the 6, 9, and 12 configuration as opposed to the 3, 6, 9 configuration with the Royal Oak chronograph. And you get a little bit of a beefier watch overall, this thing right here. It's just absolutely crazy and very heavy for even a stainless steel watch. You can't really weigh it yourself, but I'm gonna say this feels like holding us, almost like holding a solid gold watch. If I didn't know this was steel, I would assume this is white gold because it is that heavy of a watch. This design is still currently being produced. They have re-released this watch in several different variations before and, and continue to do so now. They have a titanium version. They have a new clearback flyback version, which is obviously very expensive compared to this piece. You can typically find the Clearback version with the flyback chronograph for roughly, I want to say around fifty to sixty thousand dollars. This piece right here, you can pick these up for the low twenties that are watch only, upper to the high twenties, and even mid to high thirties, depending on dial variations, uh, being full set. So a little bit about this watch: these dials are known to go tropic between certain years. I know like ninety three, ninety four, ninety five even in that range, I have seen these turn brown, which is again, a huge, gonna, it's gonna have a huge increase in price when you see something like that. You're just gonna notice the price is gonna be astronomical when a dial goes tropic with any brand. So this watch is an E-series, which run about 98 to roughly 2004. And this watch comes in a 42 millimeter case, as opposed to a 44 or larger case. This is actually a decently wearable watch. It's not something that's gonna be overbearing. Unless you have a very small wrist, then this might not be the best suit for you. But otherwise, it is a good size for the average wrist. And being that you could have this on a bracelet or even on a rubber strap, I prefer this watch personally on a rubber strap. I think it feels the best and really just complements the watch, you know, the best with a blue rubber or even black, but it is blue dial. So you probably want to go with the navy blue uh, rubber strap that AP does offer. But this particular piece right here is on a stainless steel bracelet. So one thing you'll note is the bracelet designs have kind of changed. They have more or less stayed the same, but um, that is something that they've changed throughout the years simply with class. So as you can see, this has the AP logo class. Now, if this was a modern version, it would have the flyback, or sorry, it would have the quick release buttons on the side, which you would just press and the watch would just flip open. Very convenient, but this one you actually have to flip up and pull the thing apart. You really have to put some force in it to get it open. But as you guys know, Gerald Genta designed the Royal Oak. However, Emmanuel Hewitt clearly redefined this watch for AP around 1993, giving it this new refreshed design, which really carried the brand up even more so. And it is a design that AP still uses to this day. And we as buyers and sellers of watches continue to buy and sell many times over as this is a still very much in demand watch. They're not as big and scary as they look in, you know, on camera. They actually do wear very well. You know, compared to what I wear, this is gonna be a little on the bigger side, but I think I could potentially handle that. It's not too bad. But while we're on the topic of bigger, bigger watches, it's gonna lead me into the next watch, which is the 116689. This is a Yachtmaster 2. Uh, 116689 in white gold with a platinum bezel. What makes this watch very interesting, it is a underdog for Rolex. Uh, being that, you know, if you guys are really familiar with the Yacht 2s, you guys are used to seeing them with a blue bezel, stainless steel, two-tone rose, or yellow gold with the blue bezel. And of course, they all three look great, but this is kind of the hidden underdog of the world for Yacht 2s as not a lot of people buy them, collect them. They kind of have their own cult following in a sense where people just kind of like, you know, they buy them because they really just want the weight, the look, and 
the if you know you know factor with this watch. You know, this is a, again, a really cool, cool watch. And they've since updated the design a little bit with this watch. They've kept the reference the same. So they didn't change the reference number. It's still a 116689. But what they've done is they've since added the Mercedes hands and they've added a triangle at the 12. And, you know, the triangle at the 12 in the Mercedes hands does refresh the look of the watch. And, you know, as much as I love this watch, it is definitely a better look to me personally with these straight hands. I think the Mercedes hands on this watch personally kind of give it a little bit of an awkward look, but you know, a lot of people out there prefer the Mercedes hands. We get us a lot for the Mercedes hands and that's, you know, it's totally up to the buyer on that. So what you have here is a regatta movement. So it is a pretty complicated movement. It's probably not the most complicated uh, movement Rolex makes as you know, the sky door is pretty freaking complicated, but this watch right here definitely has its own little complication and that is going to be a 10 minute countdown. So the way you would start that, you would simply rotate the bezel get it to the three o'clock position where it says, yeah, monster two in the three o'clock position that you pull the crown out, activate this, and that's going to, why is that not working? There it is, sorry, I was in the wrong here. So you have the ability to simply start your countdown at either 10 minutes or whatever, two minutes, three minutes, five. And then once you have it set, you simply rotate that back and then you start the uh, chrono, which is going to count down from five minutes down to zero. So after five minutes, what's going to happen is that's just going to be resting at zero while this continues on. So what I don't like about the watch, and I wish they did this, it would be kind of a, um, a cool added feature, is if the watch ran down to zero and then it actually stopped. So you know that it's been five minutes and it's already over, but it'll just keep running. And then it is a flyback. So that, that is pretty cool. So you do get a flyback feature with this movement. Very, very cool watch. It's very, very interesting and obviously very hefty. Again, this is a watch that you would want to wear because you definitely want the, if you know, you know factor about it. Because if people don't really recognize this watch or they somewhat recognize this, they're going to assume it's just white or stainless steel. They're not going to assume it's white gold with the big platinum bezel. That bezel is pretty chunky for the size. I personally prefer this watch over the stainless steel one just because I like that bezel more. It's not that it has to do with being white gold. It just has to do with the aesthetics. I think it has more true heritage to the Yachtmaster in itself. As you guys know, the original 40 millimeter Yachtmaster uh, was born with the platinum bezel and kind of more or less this look, even though the dial is not platinum itself, it is still a, you know, heritage to the original platinum bezel of the 16622. So there you have it. So again, that's kind of how you get it, resets. And then if you want to put this back to the 10 o'clock, which most people do, again, you would unscrew that, push that button, which activates that hand, and then you put it in the wind setting. And if you advance the time, you're actually setting it back. So you're gaining 10 minutes there. So there you have it. That is the 116689 in a nutshell for you. Again, badass watch. It's definitely a watch I would recommend if you want something on the lower end of the spectrum. Like, obviously, I'll give you the rundown here. So a yellow gold version of this watch is going to run you around 44 to 46,000. This is what we're going to offer to you guys for around 31.5. It is a complete set. It is a M letter. Keep an eye out for it if this is something that interests you. The next watch on our list is a 5513. And it's not just any 5513. It is a special 5513 as it has some special features to discuss. The only thing I'll say about this watch we bought it head only. It didn't have the right insert. So we temporarily put on this aftermarket insert just for the look. It is an aftermarket insert, but I will say this for an aftermarket insert is probably one of the wildest looking aftermarket inserts that can exist. And they are custom made by a guy out of Florida, I believe, but he does such an amazing job replicating the actual numbers and the fonts that Rolex used. You would not know this is an aftermarket insert if I didn't tell you, because if you look up what a Mark III insert, which is what would go on this watch, would look like everything would pretty much match right up. The only thing is it's kind of artificially aged and so forth, but definitely gives it a cool look. We're still hunting down the correct Mark III insert, which will add you know, a good value to the watch um, as it didn't come with the right insert to begin with. So we just kind of thought this would be a cool look for it. It's a 1969 model, one of the last years that they were doing meters first. So that is something uh, to notate about the 5513s is most of them you'll see have the um, feet first dials or the maxi dials and so forth. Uh, but this one's a little bit different. They were feet first and they were using a different type of tritium back then, which has a different reaction under UV light. Cause that's one thing I have to say when you're checking a vintage watch of this magnitude, one thing you want to look for is you want to make sure you have the correct reaction for that year. And 1967 or 1970 on back, if you hit this with a black light, you'll see a very strong green reaction. Whereas kind of when they switched to feet first and went tritium, 
uh, full tritium, then you would find more of a strong white reaction, not so much a strong, you know, green fluorescent reaction. So it kind of looks more like that. Imagine that wall decor as a kid, that starry night that people used to put on their ceilings. It would kind of look like that type of glow in the dark green versus the more of a brighter white that you're seeing with the later tritium dials. So watch is powered by a 1570 non-hacking movement. So one thing I'll show you what I'm talking about is when you wind it and pull the crown, the crown does not hack the second hand. Well, some people it bothers them because they like to set their phone to the time of their iPhone. They th I guess they like to play a game with the iPhone to see if it's running slow or fast. And obviously your, your watch isn't gonna keep pace with the iPhone time. But I still people, it's funny to me when I see people set the second hand directly to the second hand of their phone and try to keep up with it. And they try to, I guess, I guess it's useful if you wanna know how slow the watch or how fast, it's one way to do it. But the best way to do it is with a time graph. That'll tell you right on the fly what's, what's exactly going on here. But there you have it, 5513 on a strap. And I love this strap. This strap just really brings this watch out. I mean, everything kind of works together to give it a unique look. And I'll have to say one thing I love about vintage watches, as you guys know, is every 5513 you might come across, it's gonna be slightly different just because everything has always aged differently. You might have more or less patina on the dial. You might have more or less fade on the bezel. You might have more or less wear and tear on the case and so forth. So kind of everything like that will combine the watch to have overall a different, you know, different presence. So some being more valuable than others. I have seen obviously original bezels turn this kind of gunmetal gray or blue, if you will. And they bring a huge premium, you know, roughly a bezel like that can bring over $5,000 if it's that nice and original. Therefore, these guys out there are making these after aftermarket custom ones kind of get the look, but save the pocket. It is kind of an interesting look. It's pretty cool, but we've had this laying, I've had this bezel laying around for quite some time. So finally I thought I'd put it to use for this watch and it did not fail. It looks really awesome. So there you have it, 5513, beautiful watch. Can't say enough good things about this watch. It's a very simple watch. Ghost was just about everything. If you put it on a bracelet, don't be afraid to wear it with a suit because it'll stand out. So the very next watch I want to show you guys is a watch I told you was my second favorite to this watch I'm wearing, and that is the 6263 Big Red in Silver. This is the watch I prefer over the black dial. But again, like I said last time in this last episode, I would much rather wear the 6265 with the black dial and the 6263 in the silver dial. I love the way this watch contrasts with each other. You have the black bezel, silver, then black subdials with white hands. To me, there's a lot more going on as far as contrast, whereas you have what they call the reverse panda, and that's this exact same watch, but with the black dial, where everything's kind of black going into a white subdial look, which most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're already off white like this. I'll show you real quick. So as you can see, the subdials here are more tan, whereas the dial here is very strong silver. So you get more of a tan panda look here. This is kind of more of the actual panda look they go for. So one thing I absolutely want to check when I first get a watch of this magnitude is I'm going to check the parts. I'm going to work my way in and make sure everything looks copacetic and then nothing looks out of place or, you know, aftermarket. First thing is first, I like to look at the pushers, start there. Uh, these are considered P301s. Uh, whereas the, I'll show you a quick difference. Actually, I'm gonna take off my watch for the rest because I know I'm gonna be referencing this thing a lot. On the later um, 6263, 6265s, they switched these to the P302s. And if you can notice, these P302s have a little notch just right there. You see it right there, there's a little notch there. That makes it a P302. And they actually still use that notch on the service pushers. So the service pushers and the later pushers are pretty much the same. And then you obviously have a 700 series crown, which is a much bigger crown than what was on the older generation Daytonas. But on this particular watch, you have P301 pushers, which are more sought after and they're very rare. They're hard to find and very expensive if we have to replace them. And the biggest difference here too is, again, the difference between a 6263 and a 6265 are always going to be that bezel. And if you notice this bezel, you know, it's in very, very good shape and it's a Mark III bezel. So when we indicate that is, if we can get some macro shots, you really want to look at the numbers and the way they're laid out. And it's kind of a fun way to do, uh, to check. You know, if you ever go online and look up Mark III bezel and you can line it up with this one, just kind of look at the numbers, look at the way they're printed. And if you really look closely at the fives, the fours, the sevens, you'll kind of start seeing that, well, it looks consistent with where a Mark III bezel would be. So that's correct. Uh, so the, everything, you know, so far lining up with the watch is already correct. You have the correct part P301s, a 700 series crown, a Mark III bezel insert. 
obviously a big red Daytona dial. Now again, the service dials on these are very tricky and you have to be very careful when you're looking at a Daytona because you might ask yourself, I don't know if it's the original dial. Well, the original dial would have the letter word Daytona in large text, whereas the service dials have a same, the same word Daytona, but it's in a small text and it looks a little awkward. It looks more like the modern size Daytona. So if you see the word Daytona on a modern watch, that's about the contrast you're gonna get with this dial. And if you see that, you would know immediately it's a service dial that's been replaced, most likely a Luminova dial. So it would glow with the, you know, Rolex is gonna update it so that it's, you know, a little bit more current with the materials that they're using to replace it with. So Rolex is, again, they don't care about the originality of the watch. They want the functionality to be consistent with what today's standards are for watches. So, um, and again, one thing we're looking at is case condition. We, you know, when you get a watch like that. So just one thing I like to do is get it down to the point here and see how much meat is left. And this one has plenty of meat left on the case. It's not too over polished. It's been polished before, but not overly polished. If you check the cases on these, I think this one's just slightly thicker, but not much. Let me see. Uh, it's a hard tell. They're about the same, really. I'm gonna say they're the same. You know, that's one thing I like to make sure the lugs are nice and even. It's very important when you're buying a watch like this to make sure the lugs are good, make sure they're even, make sure they're not too polished down. Flip the watch over and check the bracelet. The bracelet's also very important on these. You wanna make sure you have the right bracelet or the right watch. And one thing I look for are the end links. That's the first place I'm gonna start because commonly, and it's very frustrating, but what happens is commonly they get switched for 558Bs, which if you know reference numbers to bracelet end link codes, that is code for Rolex Oyster date. So that is going to be off of a different watch, not even the same watch, but because it's a 19 millimeter bracelet, it's not a 20 millimeter, that means that bracelet, would, that end link would also fit on this watch and it would look identical and really not have any difference except for that number, but you know how we are, we gotta have a matching watch. So this one does have the correct 571 end links, which is a number you wanna see. You don't wanna see any other number there. And then it has the correct 78350 with the 19 underneath the 78, 350 to indicate that it is a 19 millimeter bracelet. And then last but not least, you wanna kinda of check the um, class code, which in this one, it is DE1. So you'd have to check it, make sure it matches the watch, which I already did, and it does. So it's good to go there. Uh, so again, this is all correct, and my client is gonna be very happy when he receives a watch, because we've gone through it very carefully, make sure everything is good. Uh, we've obviously opened it up too as well check the movement, movement checks out. And this is going to have a 72.7, which, you know, as the last, last run of those Valjeau movements, which were replaced by the automatic 16520 uh, 40-30 caliber Zenith El Primero movement. So quite a big jump from a manual wine to an automatic to a 37 millimeter to a 40. A lot of things changed with the 16520 compared to this, but to me, this watch here just has so much more personality, so much more magic. Therefore, the price points are always going to be much higher, which leads me into the market value of this said watch. Uh, so on a very, very clean 6263, you can expect to start your prices around 95,000 and go all the way up to about 150,000, depending on how complete they are, condition and so forth. The most expensive one, 6263 I have seen lately would be an, a new old stock, which was running around 160,000, brand new, never worn, still in original brand new condition. That is just absolutely insane to find something like that. But this piece has been loved. It's got some wear and tear, some signs of use. But otherwise, it's um, it's a great example, and it's in true, honest condition, and it doesn't, you know, doesn't need anything really. It just needs to keep going. So there you go. These two fucking ugly bastards. I have no idea what they are. Please, yeah, these two ugly ass. Christmas, I think you hang these on your Christmas tree. All right, the next watches I wanna talk about are very, very interesting. And I just wanna throw in the, uh, throw these in here cause they're just kind of, they're just kind of funny. They're Cartier musts, they're tanks. They're just so very dainty and very fragile feeling. And um, they really are very simple. And I'll tell you this, Cartier is probably the only brand I know that can make such a simple watch with such a bold statement. I mean, they really do just kind of stand out there they do their thing, they made little manual wine movements or probably quartz actually. Are they quartz? I don't even know. Like anything else, Cartier is probably one of the only brands I know that can make such a simple, easy to go, easy watch and make a very bold statement in just about any setting. It's a watch you could wear with just about anything really. You can sport it with a t-shirt and definitely wear this with a suit or this. I mean, you even match your suit to these watches if you wanted to. Um, they're very interesting. They have quartz movements in them. 
Um, and they're very inexpensive to get into this design. You know, a lot of these can get up there, very expensive, as you guys know. The Cartier Cloche, a very much crazy looking watch. It looks very simple. And when I first laid eyes on a Cartier Cloche, I thought to myself, well, that's gotta be a $3,500 watch. And boy, was I wrong. That, that is a $50,000 watch. And I was genuinely embarrassed that I didn't know that because I don't keep up too much with Cartier. I know Alfred loves Cartier a lot more than I do. So he should, um, he should do these two on the next segment, but. Moving on, these are the Cartiers. They're, they're called the Must, M-U-S-T. And like I said, they're just kind of fun and interesting. And I saw these two and I was like, boy, is it Christmas in July or what? But it's not quite July, but I was just like, wow. <laughs> they definitely uh, go with the Christmas theme. Um, and it's something, I don't know, I almost want to wear one on each wrist when I wear these, if I ever wear these. But very interesting watches. Um, they're very inexpensive to get into these. These are roughly $3,500, so they're both on our website. So if you go to our website, type in Cartier Must, these two will pop up and you can check them out. One's a 2021, the other one's a 2022. I don't know which one's which at the moment, but I will say they're just really interesting. I just thought I'd show you guys real quick before we end the segment. So that is going to be it for us today. And I hope you guys really enjoyed that segment. And like always, don't forget to like, subscribe, hit that bell for me if you wanna see more content like this. And as always, thank you guys so much. We'll see you next time. Thank you.